In the aftermath of the Great Fire of London, Parliament met and held a committee of inquiry. As you can see, the report they produced was called A True and Faithful Account of the Several Informations Exhibited to the Honourable Committee Appointed by the Parliament to Inquire into the Late Dreadful Burning of the City of London. This report proved controversial and Parliament was denied the opportunity to debate it. Soon after, copies were printed so the general public could see what they had found. These copies were confiscated and burnt by the public hangman. Therefore, the official parliamentary inquiry into the fire had its findings burnt. The report was so controversial it was eventually reprinted in 1679 and again in 1689. Before we look at the report in detail, it's necessary to look at the historical context. In 1664, England had been in a gruelling three-year war with the Dutch. This had severely damaged trade and many basic goods became very expensive. This meant when the plague hit in 1665, many people were already suffering from mal malnutrition. And when the fire hit in 1666, many saw divine judgment at play. After all, fire, famine, war and disease had struck the capital. There was no parallel for this in world history, not even in the Old Testament. The poet laureate John Dryden called 1666 the year of miracles. These unprecedented catastrophes all occurred early in the reign of Charles II and I want to show you the context in which his reign occurred. Ten years before he was crowned, Charles II's father Charles I was executed. This was followed by a decade of dictatorship under Oliver Cromwell and the Commonwealth. Cromwell's death in 1658 left a bit of a mess that was eventually tidied up when Charles became king in 1660. Charles reigned for 25 years but never produced a legitimate heir and as Charles grew older it became increasingly apparent his younger brother James would succeed him. This is a picture of the two Stuart brothers, Charles on the left, James on the right. It's fair to say James became the most controversial man in British politics. No exaggeration to say he was deeply, deeply unpopular. So unpopular in fact that when he became king in 1685 it didn't take long for him to be replaced and in 1688 Parliament invited his son-in-law William of Orange to come over to Britain and take the crown from James which he did. This is a portrait of William of Orange with his wife Mary who was James Stuart's daughter. With this context in mind it's now possible for us to have a look at the report in some detail. The report begins very uncontroversially. It states that the fire began in Pudding Lane at the Bakers of Thomas Farriners. If you want to read the whole statement, please press pause now. At the bottom of the page, it states that the report was ready on the 22nd of January and on the 8th of February, Parliament was prorogued before the report could be debated. What I want to show you is the content of this report that I believe resulted in Parliament's prorogation. There was content of this report that was so controversial there was no way the King could afford for it to be debated in Parliament. The next entry as you can see is from the 25th of September and this lists members of Parliament who were made members of this committee. You can see some are highlighted, this is because in a minute we're going to go through and look at some of these people in more detail. You can see on the 9th of October, additional members of Parliament were added to the committee, including all the members that served for the City of London, which meant prior to this, none of them were sitting on the committee. So the first name on that list is Sir Charles Harbord, and I want to show you a little bit about him. As you can see, he served under both Charles I and Charles II. Under Charles I, he was Surveyor General, which makes him the second most senior person in respect to the national defence. This was in the lead up to the Civil War. You can assume Sir Charles was very well trusted. He was also trusted with the, the money of both Charles I's wife, Henrietta Maria, and Charles II's wife, uh, Catherine of Braganza. It's safe to say, therefore, that Sir Charles Harbord was trusted by the royal party. Next on the list was Mr Sandys and I could not identify who this person was. My method was to go to the History of Parliament online, look at the correct era and the, the alphabetical listing for Sandys and you can see there are actually three names highlighted, two of which were the correct age to have sat on the committee. Now, membership of this committee is not listed anywhere on the Parliamentary History website. This committee seems to have fallen off the historical radar 
in many ways and this is just one of them so I wasn't able to ascertain which Mr Sandys it was who sat on the committee. There wasn't that problem with Colonel John Birch however as you can see his career was clearly parliamentarian. He fought on the parliamentary side during the Civil War and rose to the Governor of Bath and being Governor of Hereford, clearly a trusted member of the parliamentarian side of the Civil War back in Cromwell. So far we've had Sir Charles Harbord, who was clearly Royalist, Mr Sandys we can't identify, and Colonel Birch who was clearly a parliamentarian. Next on the list is Sir Robert Brooke who was the Chairman of the Parliamentary Inquiry into the fire. Now there is no portrait for Robert Brooke but we do know he was knighted in 1660 for loyalty to the crown, aged 24. Most interestingly, in 1669, a few years after the report was published, Sir Robert Brooke retired to France upon the distress of his affairs. Something had gone badly wrong for him, and he was drowned while bathing in the Rhone, aged 33. Now, I'm going to show you what Sir Robert Brooke wrote in this report. And it is this, I believe, that led to the distress of his affairs and his early death. The controversy that surrounded this report and Sir Robert Brooke's early death are connected. Next member of the committee I wanted to draw your attention to was this guy William Prynne who held offices both under Cromwell and under Charles II. Now William Prynne was such a, an ardent Puritan that he actually received a savage beating from the hand, at the hands of the public hangman in the run up to the Civil War. He railed against decorous religion, what he called popery, so much so that he lobbied and eventually was successful in having the former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, executed. This is Lord Herbert who sat on the committee. As far as I can see, he never achieved anything other than his uncle being the King's Master of Revels. This is Sir John Maynard, a lawyer who worked both for Cromwell under the Commonwealth and for Charles II uh, up until his death. Now, Maynard was considered to be a turncoat by Pepys for changing side when the when the regime changed. You can see he was probably a careerist politician rather than someone with deeply held beliefs. The member of the committee that's best known to us now is Samuel Pepys of the diary fame. He was very much a Stuart loyalist. He worked very closely with James Stuart at the Navy office and after the glorious revolution of 1688 he was twice arrested. I wanted to show you one other member of this committee for whom there is no portrait but his name was Sir William Thompson who was a member of parliament for the city and a very rich and powerful man. You can see in his biography he was second in command at the first battle of Newbury. Sir William Thompson was a rich dedicated parliamentarian who ended up buying one of the largest manor houses in West London called Osterley. So here are the 70 odd names of all the members of the committee and what I've done is I've highlighted in red those members of the committee that were sympathetic to the King's government. Luckily for me in 1661 a Lord Wharton went round and made an assessment of who would be loyal to the King's government and who wouldn't. As I say the names highlighted in red are those designated by Lord Wharton as sympathetic to the King's government. As you can see, the vast majority of the committee were well disposed towards the King. So we've now established that broadly the committee that investigated the fire was sympathetic to the King and his government. The first piece of evidence submitted in the report is a letter dated the 23rd of August 1666, so a couple of weeks before the fire happened. I'll quote it to you. Pray acquaint me with the truth of certain news which is a common in this country, that a fire from heaven is fallen on a city called Belk, situated on the side of the River Thames, where a world of people have been killed and burnt and houses are also consumed. The report seemed to suggest that this was some kind of coded message that might be sent between uh, people in the know. You can see that this uh, letter was sent from France into London a week or so before the fire. Now you might consider this a strange coincidence. It's certainly interesting as a written document from before the fire predicting the fire. Now this document is the first piece of information submitted to the report. What follows is nothing like as interesting. A series of hearsay reports of he said she said. I'm going to skip past those. You can pause and read them if you like. 
Having examined a few instances of hearsay, the report then at the bottom of page 7 states, Robert Hubert of Rhone, Normandy, who acknowledged that he was the one who fired the house of Mr. Farriner a baker in Pudding Lane, from whence the fire had its beginning, confessed. It is a matter of record that on the 27th of October 1666, Robert Hubert was executed for his part in the fire, to which he had confessed. In his confession, Hubert explained that he'd come to London via Sweden in a boat with a man called Stephen Peedlow, who'd encouraged him into the act. They went to Pudding Lane and Peedlow tried to get Hubert to put a fireball into the baker. Hubert refused, Pedlow got impatient and put the fireball in himself. You can read this if you like. Understandably, Hubert's confession was extremely controversial and it was debated for decades afterwards. I want to draw your attention to what this man, Gilbert Benet, the Bishop of Salisbury, had to say about Hubert's confession. This is taken from Bernay's book, The History of My Own Time, which I'd highly recommend to anyone who wants to get to know the era a bit better. Gilbert said, It is true he gave so broken an account of the whole matter that he was thought mad. Yet he was blindfolded and carried to several places of the city, and then his eyes opened, and he was asked if that was the place, and he being carried to the to wrong places. After he looked around for some time, he had said that this was not the place. But when he was brought to the place where the fire broke out, he affirmed that this was the true place. And Tillotson told me that Howe, then recorder of London, was with him and had much discourse with him, and he concluded it was impossible that it could be a melancholy dream. In other words, Hubert was telling the truth. This is John Tillotson that Bernay was talking to. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury under William and Mary after the Glorious Revolution one of William's most trusted advisers. This next passage comes as a result of Bernay talking to Tillotson about Hubert's case. Tillotson, who believed that the city was burnt on design, told me a circumstance that made the papists employing such a creased man in a service much more credible. Longhorn, the popish council at law, who for many years passed for a Protestant, was dispatching a half-witted man to manage the elections in Kent before the restoration. Tillotson, being present and observing what a sort of man he was, asked Langhorne how he could employ him in such a service. Langhorne answered it was a maxim with him in dangerous services to employ none but the half-witted, if they could but keep a secret and obey orders, for if they should change their minds and turn informers instead of agents, it would be easy to discredit them and to carry off the weight of any discoveries they could make and make and show that they were madmen and so not likely to be trusted in critical things. In other words, Langhorne used half-witted men like Hubert because if they confessed, they wouldn't be believed. Half-witted or not, Hubert was still hung and the inquiry had further evidence to implicate him. We can see from page 8 of the report that a Mr Graves, a French merchant that was known to Hubert, went to visit him in prison. He challenged Hubert as to his guilt, to which Hubert replied, Yes, sir, I am guilty of it, and have been brought to it by the instigation of Monsieur Piedlow, but not out of any malice to the English nation, but from a desire of reward which he promised me when upon my return to France. This Mr. Graves also said he knew Stephen Piedlow and knew him to be a very deboist person and an apt of any wicked design. Immediately following this on page 8, we read, It is observable that this miserable creature who confessed himself to the committee to be a Protestant was a Papist and died so. This is worth dwelling on for a moment because it's used to discredit the committee. Hubert was a Protestant, lived his entire life as a Protestant, that was well established, and the committee calling him a Catholic was used to show that the committee was just being vehemently anti-Catholic for no good reason. You can understand what's going on here by reading this extract from the 1689 version of the report. Mr. Wooten informeth that on the 16th of October he went to Newgate Prison meeting with one Howard, an underkeeper at the door, desired to speak with Mr. Hubert, the Frenchman who was then condemned. Howard told him that he could not speak with him yet, for Mr. Harvey, the Queen Mother's confessor, was in private with him, and said this Harvey used to frequently come to the prison after condemnation, and that where one prisoner died a Protestant, many died Papists. Mr. Wooten said after some stay he saw Mr. Harvey come out 
from Mr Hubert and then he was admitted to have speech with him. In other words, the Queen Mother's confessor would go to Newgate Prison and convert people to Catholicism. So Hubert, in all likelihood, lived a Protestant but actually died a Catholic as a result of that conversion. The report continues and shows that Hubert's story was tested by the local authorities. They'd take him around trying to get him to identify where the fire started. The full report of Mr Lohman, the jailer, is available here for you to read. The next sentence is really interesting. It reads, It being intimated to the committee that notwithstanding the confession of the said Hubert, it was confidently reported the fire in the forementioned Farriner's house began by accident. Now that's written into the re report before any conclusions had been reached. Whose confidence was this? How come they knew so certainly that the fire began by accident? The committee therefore sent for him, the said Farriner, before them who being examined said, it was impossible any fire should happen in his house by accident, for he had, after twelve of the clock the night before, gone through every room thereof, and found no fire but in one chimney, where the room was paved with bricks, which fire he diligently raked up in embers. He was then asked whether no window or door might let in the wind to disturb those coals. He affirmed there was no possibility for any wind to disturb them and it was absolutely set fire on purpose. This is the testimony of the man whose bakery burnt down. Farriner's testimony was central to Hubert's conviction. Whatever the rights and wrongs of Hubert's conviction, it did have a massive impact on London. This is because up until Hubert's execution, the fire had been deemed by Charles II to be an act of God. This meant that no insurance was payable to tenants who would have to continue to pay their rent and pay for the reconstruction of their homes. This was going to lead to financial ruin for thousands, tens of thousands of people in London. Charles's declaration that the fire was an act of God was actually contrary to advice he'd received a few days before when his Lord Chancellor had reported to him that it was the universal conclusion of the people of London that the, the fire had not come by chance, i.e. that there was deliberate action involved. Charles ignored this advice and it was only Hubert's execution that offered the people of London any respite. By the time the report was printed, of course, in January, this was all history and that's where we'll leave Hubert. The report continues with a number of eyewitness accounts of people committing arson. Dawes Wayman Sol Esquire, one of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace, informed that he saw a man apprehended in the time of the fire near the temple with his pockets stuffed with combustible matter made of flax, tow and such like materials. Dr John Packer informs that he saw a man in the time of the fire throw some combustible matter into a shop in the Old Bailey, which he thinks was the shop of, the, of an apothecary, and that immediately thereupon he saw a great smoke and smell of brimstone. That person did this, immediately ran away, but upon the outcry of the people he was taken by the guards. I want you to notice the word guards there. Mr Random, Mr Haslam and Mr Humphrey Bowyer do all agree they saw a person flinging something into a house near St Antonine's church, and thereupon the house was on fire, and the smoke therefore infested the adjacent houses, and when this was done there was no place, no fire near the place. Mr Michael March, an officer in the train band in a company of Sir Richard Brown, apprehended a walloon in the time of the fire at the Nags Head in Leadenhall Street with an instrument like a dark lantern made, as is conceived, to lay a train of powder and it was filled with gunpowder. There were two more of the same nation in his company. They being asked to what they, what they employed the, the same instrument would give no account thereof. And... Newton Killingworth Esquire informed that he apprehended a person during the fire about whom he found much combustible matter and certain black things of a long figure which he could not endure to hold in his hand by reason of their extreme heat. This person was so surprised at first that he would not answer to any question but being on his way to Whitehall he acted the part of a madman and so continued while, he, while they were with him. Continues, Sir John Maynard, a member of this house, affirms that he had some of the combustible matter in his hands, and though it were in its natural substance and unfired, yet the heat of it was scarcely to be endured by the touch. So, in addition to Hubert, there were several other arsonists who were spotted, some of whom were apprehended. 
Teng continues, Mr Freeman of Southwark, a brewer whose house was lately fired, informs. Now, I want to just show you what this means. Southwark is on the opposite side of the river to Pudding Lane and, at the time, upwind of it. It would have been impossible for the fire from Pudding Lane to spread to Southwark naturally. And this is what the report shows. Mr Freeman informs that on the day his house was fired, about a quarter of an hour before that happened, a paper with a ball of wildfire containing nearly a pound weight wrapped in it was found in the nave of a wheel, in the wheel yard where lay a great quantity of timber. How his house was fired he knoweth not, but, but this he affirmed to the committee, that it could not be by accident because there had not been any candle or fire in the house where the hay lay that whole day, and that hay being laid in very dry and before midsummer could not possibly be, be set on fire within itself. Moreover, he said that the hayloft was on fire at the top of the house and that the fire spread from one end of the roof to the other in an instant. This sounds very much like arson. The bottom of page 10 contains this. You can read. At the bottom of page 10 we find the killer sentence, the one that I contend led to Sir Robert Brooke's early death as well as making the report so controversial. And here it is. I had order from the committee, so he's writing as himself as Sir Robert Brooke, to acquaint you that we had traced several persons apprehended upon strong suspicion during the fire to the guards, but could not make any further discovery of them. We saw a mention of the guards earlier in the report. So who exactly are they? As it turns out, there are three further mentions of these guards, and we're going to look at each in turn, skipping around the report. Page 11, you see a Frenchman was apprehended who had fireballs on him, taken by the commander of the lifeguard, and was not seen again. Next, we see on page 16, someone was caught with fireballs, and again handed over to the guard, this time in Southwark. On page 19 we find this entry that I'll read in full. On Monday the 3rd of September there was a Frenchman taken firing a house and upon searching of him fireballs were found about him at which time four of the lifeguard rescued the Frenchman and took him away from the people after their usual manner in the whole time of the fire. Now that bit was emphasised in the committee report. That's not my uh, emphasis there. That's original. So who the hell were these people that kept rescuing arsonists. This is a picture of the lifeguard. It depicts a scene in May 1660 when Charles II in the coach at the back there was being led into London on the way to being declared king. The lifeguard were the king's personal protection force. They'd actually been formed in 1656 in Bruges when Charles and his brother James were in exile and working for the king of Spain. The lifeguard's first ever action was actually against fellow Englishmen at Dunkirk fighting the forces of Cromwell. The lifeguards were famously Charles's most trusted and loyal supporters. As quickly as I can I want to give you a flavour of who these people were. Now Abraham Cowley was a member of the lifeguard. He was known as a poet but in reality he worked day to day as a cipher coding and decoding letters for the royal family. Today, Cowley is remembered as the first Englishman to ever write about cocaine. He literally wrote poems about coca and how great it was. Cowley and the other lifeguards were in France when cocaine first became popular on the continent and that circle were integral to bringing the white powder back to London when they, at the Restoration in 1660. It's fair to say Abraham Cowley and the lifeguards knew how to have a good time. One of the more famous members of the lifeguards was Captain Robert Holmes, who was actually responsible for starting the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars. Not a mean achievement. As well as being famous for starting two wars, perhaps Robert Holmes' greatest achievement was what was known as Holmes Bonfire that happened on the 19th and 20th of August 1666 where he set fire to a Dutch town and about 140 Dutch vessels. This during the second Anglo-Dutch war that he'd started a couple of years before. So when London caught fire in September of 1666 some people suggested it was the Dutch in revenge for Holmes Bonfire. This is what 
Bishop Bernay recorded about this incident. The English fleet had landed on the Vlie, an island near the Texel, and had burnt it, upon which some came to De Witt and offered a revenge, that they would set fire on London if they might be well furnished and well rewarded for it. De Witt, Johann De Witt, was the Dutch leader. He rejected the proposition, for he said he would not make the breach wider nor the quarrel irre irreconcilable. He's talking about the quarrel between the English and the Dutch. He said it was brought to him by one of the Labadists, uh, which is a French Protestant sect, as sent to him by some others. He made no further reflection on the matter uh, until the city was burnt. Then he began to suspect there had been a design, and that they had been induced to draw him into it to lay the odium of the fire on the Dutch. In other words, Johann de Witt believed he was being offered revenge, in, and burnt people offered to burn London for him, but he realised subsequently this might have been a trap to lay the blame for the fire on the Dutch. That's what Johann de Witt, the Dutch leader, believed. So, between Robert Holmes' starting walls and Abraham Cowley's writing about cocaine, you can see the Kingsguard were quite a lively bunch. They were gentlemen officers close to the Crown, so close, in some senses, they were above the law. It was these people that Parliament had named as rescuing arsonists and Sir Robert Brooke had specified them in that sentence he wrote. It's perhaps becoming clearer why on the 8th of February Charles II prorogued Parliament. The report named some of his closest friends as rescuing arsonists across London whilst the fire was happening. Could it get any more embarrassing? Well, uh, yes, it could. So feel free to pause and read this, but essentially you have a man who set fire to his house, whose own son bore witness against him, and then right at the bottom, uh, under where it says page 19, he answered above stairs, The bill was likewise found, but the petty jury being too much influenced and overawed by the LCJK did not find him guilty. In other words, a man who'd been caught committing arson and his own son bore witness against him, was not found guilty because of the LCJK. And this is Lord Chief Justice Kelling, who twice in the report is cited for obstructing justice. I'm going to say the Lord Chief Justice would not process a trial at the Old Bailey, and he seemed to have put pressure on a jury to find a man who was clearly guilty, not guilty. Twice, Parliament names the Lord Chief Justice, on pages 18 and 19, as interfering in investigations into the fire. How embarrassing. Now his Lord Chief Justice, the head of the judiciary, and a bunch of his friends seem to be complicit in the fire. But actually, things were considerably worse than that. 20, we read, In the time of the fire, a constable took a Frenchman firing a house, seized on him, and going to a magistrate with him, met His Royal Highness the Duke of York, who asked the reason for the tumult. One told him that a Frenchman was taken firing a house. His eyes called for the man who spoke to him in French. The Duke asked who would attest it. The constable said, I took him in the act. I will attest it. The Duke took him into custody and said, I will secure him. But he was heard of no more. In other words, James, Duke of York, the King's brother, was also rescuing arsonists. And this was recorded as fact in the parliamentary report. During the fire, James and his friends in the lifeguards had set up a series of command posts to help organise the pulling down of buildings and the managing of the fire. These achieved very little. However, it did mean that James and his friends were right in the thick of the action during the whole last couple of days of the fire. Now, from those mentions of James and his friends, you can see that perhaps the people writing the parliamentary report thought they had ulterior motives for being there. You can see here pages 23 and 24, the last bits of the report, detail a witness statement made by one John Stewart. And I, I invite you to read it, but I'm going to summarise it for you anyway. It says he was helping clear out a library during the time of the fire. At that time, a man wearing white walked into the library. He didn't know him. Almost immediately near this stranger, some papers caught fire and Stewart was naturally suspicious. He grabbed hold of the man and started wrestling with him in the course of which the man's wig fell off and it seemed he was wearing black priestly clothes underneath his, what was clearly a disguise. Stuart says he then handed this man over to James, Duke of York. 
this incredibly detailed account of someone committing arson whilst in disguise seems compelling. And Stuart says three times he handed over this man to the Duke of York. So where did he go? What happened to this clearly disguised arsonist? These would have been questions asked in Parliament if Charles II hadn't prorogued it. The report implicated his best friends, his brother and his Lord Chief Justice. Is it any wonder that Parliament was prorogued? By mentioning the guards in writing, Sir Robert Brooke and the committee had put Charles's government in extreme peril. So we can see now why this version of the report, printed sometime after the prorogation of Parliament, was incredibly controversial and was burnt. A parliamentary report was burnt. Now, 13 years later, this version of the report was printed, as I said, in 1679. This makes no mention whatsoever of James the Duke of York and is edited in a number of ways that make it considerably less controversial. I would suggest it was printed by Friends of the Kings. I wanted to show you this example from page 9 in the original report and page 4 in the 1679 version. You can see Mr Michael March in 1667 thought he'd seen a Walloon, a person from Belgium or the Low Countries. By 1679 he corrected himself and realised he'd seen a woman. And indeed in the 1679 version all the major details are downplayed. Like I say, the 1679 version seems to have been printed by Friends of the King trying to downplay the contents of the report. So the 1679 version of the report seemed to be edited to favour the King. This was not the case in 1689. After the Glorious Revolution, a third version of the report was printed and this put back the details about James, Duke of York. This was a non-sympathetic account and I'll show you the title page so you can see exactly what I mean. I typed it all out so it was nice and clear. The bit I want to draw your attention to says, By all of which it appears that the said fires were contrived and carried on by the Papists, now humbly offered to, to the consideration of all true Protestants. By 1689 it was fashionable to say that the fire of London was definitely done by Catholics. And I wanted to draw your attention to this quote, printed on the front page of the report. It says, Does any man now begin to doubt how London came to be burnt, or by what ways and means poor Justice Godfrey, Godfrey fell? This is a quote from the Lord Chancellor Finch at the speech of a uh, man called Stafford. This is his portrait. Uh, Heneage Finch was Lord Chancellor, head of the King's government. In the 1670s he investigated scandals around the exclusion crisis, whether James should become king or not. And the end of the trial of a Lord Stafford in December 1680, he remarked, Who can doubt any longer that London was burnt by Papists? That's the head of the King's government in 1680. This report was controversial for good reason. I believe Parliament was prorogued because of it. You can see for decades afterwards, the fire was still a matter of contention. And unlike how we're taught it today, there are intelligent people on both sides of the argument. And I wanted to end with a quote from Gilbert Benet. On the 2nd of September, a fire broke out that raged for three days as if it had a commission to devour everything it, that was in its way. On the fourth day, it stopped in the midst of very combustible matter. That which is still a great secret is whether it was casual or raised on design. There was so great a diversity of opinions in the matter that I must leave it under the same uncertainty in which I found it. I hope by looking at the report in this way I've raised some interesting questions for you to ponder. You can find the reports that I've cited here. This is uh, part of the University of Michigan's early English book series as, and has been invaluable to me. I can't find copies of these anywhere else. Of course, if you want to learn more you could always have a look at my book, Architecture of Power.